Hey everybody, welcome back to Project Happy Home. For those of you who are new here, I'm Tanya, a doctor lawyer turned homeschool mom of three kids ages nine, six, and four. My eldest has ADHD and this Parenting ADHD 101 series is all about sharing tips and tricks about how to parent your child if they have ADHD and how to guide them through life in a way that bolsters their confidence and also improves your relationship with them. This is the third video in the series, so if you haven't caught the first two, be sure to check out my playlist down below. That playlist also includes several videos about ADHD that I did over the last couple of years that are just more general, but also include different tips that might be helpful to you. In this video, we'll be talking about some of the methods of diagnosing your child with ADHD and how that process actually looks. Now, before we get into that, there is the question of whether you want to label your child with ADHD. Now, I very much lean towards the camp that says embrace the label, empower the label. We can give our children so much strength in their diagnosis in knowing the way that their brain is actually wired. There is so much power behind knowing the good things and the bad things, the struggles and the things that come easier to them, honestly. For me, knowledge is power we can empower the label. Labels are only bad if we let them be. If you want to hear more about my thoughts on that, I did a video on labeling your child with ADHD and I will link that below in the description box as well as up above. So to get down to it, diagnosing your child with ADHD. At this point, once you've gotten the inkling that there might be something like ADHD or an attention deficit or a learning difference going on with your child, whether you have realized that on your own or whether someone in a school environment or a church environment or in the family has told you, it can be kind of a scary time. You can be worried and anxious about how that makes you look, what people will think about your parenting, etc. It's really normal to be nervous. It's really normal to have that feeling that I'm about to be judged because I'm even testing my kid for this, that I've already been judged because people think he might have this. And honestly, the faster you can let go of that, the better for you and for your kid. Because, because some of us are wired differently and it makes it hard for us to do things like sit still in a classroom. That doesn't make you a bad parent. That doesn't make your child a bad kid. That means that there's something neurologically different going on. And if we learn what that is, we can do the best we can to address it and to help them out and to make them feel good about themselves and not bad about themselves while still meeting societal expectations. We can do this together, but let's be honest about it, get our diagnosis and move forward. One of the most confusing things at the beginning is just deciding who do you actually go see? Because the list of people who can evaluate and diagnose your child with ADHD is so very long. It can range from a general pediatrician to a behavioral and developmental pediatrician to a psychiatrist, to a psychologist, to a school psychiatrist, to a school counselor, to a social worker, to cognitive and behavioral therapists, to neurologists, to behavioral neurologists. There are so many different people who are technically qualified to diagnose your child with ADHD. Now, as a physician myself, and as a parent who's gone through the process, I have real issues with some of the ways that certain professions diagnose ADHD. Personally, I feel like the best way to go about it is to receive a full uh, learning and behavioral evaluation where you get a comprehensive type of screening and meeting of your child where the professional is not just looking at your questionnaire and deciding, okay, you seem to be having these issues. You've met this many check boxes. We're going to say he has ADHD and here's your prescription. Um, I find that to be a somewhat irresponsible way of diagnosing ADHD. And I feel that when you go to someone who is trained in development and behavioral issues in children, that you can get a much more comprehensive view of your child's unique wiring and also what types of therapies and modalities might be available to you, including medication and other things. So in my personal opinion, I would not accept a diagnosis from someone who is just going off an initial meeting with the child and a questionnaire. I would want a comprehensive evaluation that lasts about four to six hours. So that is my two cents on that. Regardless of who is actually going to be evaluating your child's ADHD, there should be a few things that are happening across the board. One, there should be an initial conversation with your child. 
uh, both in your company and without, where they discuss, you know, what kinds of things might the child be worried about? What kinds of things has the child noticed about themselves and their environment that might be giving them difficulty, that they might be finding easier or harder? What types of activities in the home might be easier or harder? That initial conversation with the child to see whether they perceive any difficulty themselves is an important step. Another thing the clinician should definitely be doing is asking you all the normal questions you generally get at a pediatrician's office, like things like developmental milestones, whether the child has any eating problems, any sleep problems, any digestive issues, whether there's any motor function issues, whether there's any ongoing medical problems, whether the child's ever had any hospitalizations, those general questions that you usually are accustomed to answering at a pediatrician's office. That should be asked regardless of who is doing this evaluation. The clinician should be really interested in how your child is functioning. This evaluation and diagnosis should not be solely based on your questionnaire or a teacher's questionnaire. This should center around your child and how your child is acting in the world. Are they actually having difficulties functioning in their world, in their home environment, in their school environment, in their social environment? How are their friendships? How is their classroom setting? How is their learning behaviors? How do they respond to discipline? How do they respond to normal procedures in the home, etc.? Do they have an appropriate response to age appropriate tasks and chores and responsibilities? Questions like this. We are not diagnosing kids based on other people's frustrations. That's one of my issues with some of the practitioners who diagnose based solely on questionnaires provided by teachers and parents, because fundamentally this evaluation should center around that child and not on any perceived difficulties that adults have with that child. That being said, the questionnaires can be really helpful because they, prof they provide a normed response, meaning that they are a uniform standardized questionnaire. We know that when you have a more neurotypical child, these are the types of answers that we receive. And we know that when you have a child that may be differently wired with ADHD, you have the spectrum of answers on this other side. So it does provide a clue. I just don't think it should be the sole reason that you arrive at an ADHD diagnosis. The clinician should also be interested in academic performance, whether homeschooled or not whether the child has been pretty much the same in terms of academic performance since earlier or whether there's been a marked shift. Has there been anything changing in the academic performance? Is there any particular area in which they're particularly weak, like math or English or history or listening skills? Is there anything they find especially difficult like arithmetic or writing or just the act of repeating back, things like that? It is important that the clinician evaluate your child to assess whether there's any other coexisting conditions going on because ADHD often comes with a host of other things, whether it be, you know, sensory processing disorder or dyscalculia or dysgraphia or some other learning difference. You know, there's anxiety is often uh, a component of children with ADHD as well as depression. So you want this evaluation to be comprehensive for your child. Cost can be a concern with these evaluations, but in my view, if you're going to go through this process and actually look into whether your child is differently wired, you will be best served by getting a more complete picture because that will allow you to address all these different points with the greatest degree of compassion and patience. It is incredibly helpful for a parent to see on paper in black and white, these things are going on in your kid's brain. These things are areas of strengths and these are areas of weakness and we can do X, Y, and Z to address them. That conversation is really important to have and you can only have it if you have a complete picture. When the clinician makes their evaluation, you really wanna ask them exactly what are the diagnostic criteria for ADHD based on whatever testing you've done and how have they met these criteria? Because a lot of times children will have one or two or three or four of the things, but not all of the things or not enough of the things to justify a diagnosis. And they can be diagnosed anyway. And this is something I've actually heard of from some of my friends. And it's part of the thing that makes people say that, oh, ADHD isn't a real thing. ADHD is like way over diagnosed and stuff. Because honestly, in some instances, I think it might be because people can be a little bit cavalier about diagnosing off of these questionnaires without actually meeting the criteria for diagnosis. So those criteria can be changing. The new DSM will be coming out and 
a lot of things about the criteria for the diagnosis of ADHD is projected to change in the new DSM. And these things are always in flux. So always be responsible. Look up these things yourself. You are your child's best advocate and best protector. So um, really seek to understand that the clinician knows what they're doing, that they're evaluating based on an objective standard and not just based on your responses or your stories or your teacher's opinion, etc. Often after the initial evaluation, there will be a follow-up meeting. And in that follow-up meeting, the clinician will go over all the results of the testing with you. It should be a line by line, page by page sort of discussion where they really explain the results of all the different tests and what they mean. And they should also explain to you what types of treatment options there are, whether they be medication or supplements, whether they be um, occupational therapy or behavioral therapy, whether it be different types of devices you can use, like the Revive bracelet that we use at home, or like charts for progress, things like that. They should be able to give you different tools and point you to different resources that would be helpful. As I've always said, two of the websites that I always point parents to is attitudemag.com and understood.org. I think both of those have excellent articles, both on this process of diagnosis, but also various different treatment options that there are out there and various different ways for parents to think about this as they discipline their kids, as they work through different issues, etc. So. There's a world of resources out there for us now, and that's really something that the clinician should be able to point you towards, and you yourself should be able to find online as well. And meanwhile, if your kid does go to school, before you even start looking for any kind of behavioral therapist or occupational therapist or any kind of outside resources to help your child, you should be looking into ways you can help your child at home ways you can learn how to connect with your child in a more compassionate fashion, talk to them in a way that gets them actually listening and feeling safe with you. And also, if your child is going to school, you can talk to your child's school teacher about creating an IEP or individualized education plan so that you can best address your kids' needs in the classroom. That's another huge benefit of getting a diagnosis is that you can get these plans in place, these accommodations, that can help boost your child's achievement in school and make that learning environment a little bit better for them at least. And of course, if you go the homeschooling route, you can learn how to craft that environment to work for your kid the best. And it's not the easiest, and I'll tell you that as somebody who's been homeschooling for three years. It does not solve all the problems or anything, but I certainly do have a lot more freedom in deciding you know, when my child's school day is over, when he has to go outside and run around, where he can do his work. I'm okay with him doing his work anywhere, for example. So he can do it lying down, he can do it upstairs, downstairs, on a trampoline, wherever he wants, so long as it gets done. So everyone has their different rules and their different needs, and um, that is unique to every family. But certainly, uh, the fact that schools now are recognizing the need for IEPs and things like that is really an encouraging sign. Finally, one thing I would suggest is before you go to the self-evaluation, make sure that you have really done a self-evaluation yourself. When did you first start noticing these things in your child? When did these symptoms begin? What is creating the most sort of havoc or disturbance in your child's life, in your life? Is it at home? Is it at school? Do they mainly just have these problems at school or do you also notice differences at home? Um, do they mainly just have these problems at home and school seems perfectly fine with his behavior? You want to notice these little things down. Do you notice that his behavior or her behavior gets worse or better in the morning or in the evening? Is bath time at time a particular difficulty or is it meal times when they have to sit still for a very long time? Is homework a time of particular struggle? Does your child have difficulty forming friendships with children of his own age? Things like that are good things to reflect upon. Ask those questions of yourself, take those notes down. Um, sometimes when you are meeting with a clinician to discuss your child, especially with such a sensitive topic as ADHD, you can feel nervous and a little bit threatened and a little bit just scattered. So it's good to have these things written down and on paper before you go. Obviously, they'll want you to bring in a lot of their medical records and perhaps even academic records, so be prepared to gather that information. But much more important than that is just to have like just a bullet list on your own as, your, as their parent, as the person who loves them best in the world. What have you noticed? 
You know, it's a good time to have a conversation with your child too about what this evaluation is about and um, why we're doing it and what did they think about it? Do they think anything good can come out of it, etc. And how you go about that is up to you as well. But it's a good opportunity to really think on these things before you go, before you get an outsider's perspective, it's important to sort of solidify your own. What has your experience been? Get it down on one sheet of paper so that your thoughts are not all scattered and all over the place. So I hope this video has been helpful to you guys. I didn't wanna to go too much into the weeds with it, but that is basically what you can expect. In our case, we went to see a retired school psychologist who had opened up a private practice. So I felt that he had really good reviews and he had a lot of experience with school-age children and diagnosing ADHD. Quite happily, he was very pro-homeschooling. He and I seemed to meet as um, two people who had the same view about ADHD and how it could contain strengths and weaknesses and was in no way like something to be ashamed of, etc. The evaluation lasted about four and a half hours. We had an initial meeting, the evaluation at a second date, and then we had a follow-up meeting which lasted about an hour where we discussed the results. And while it was costly, it was completely worth my time and I still refer to that report just to see like whether anything's been changing, whether I notice any differences and it's a good little marker for me of like where my child was at that stage and what kinds of things you know I should be focusing on and every now and then I refer to it so that I can just be refreshed in my knowledge that you know this isn't something that my child is doing on purpose when he's struggling, when he's having a bad day. He's not creating a problem for me. He's having a problem. Like he's having a difficulty right there and I can be the best one to help him out with it. So I am really grateful that I got an evaluation from somebody that I trusted, that I respected, and that gave me a lot of helpful information. And I hope that the same happens for you. So thank you again for your time, you guys. I really appreciate it. Stay tuned for more videos on ADHD parenting from me. I hope to put them out at least every two weeks or so. And if you have any specific questions that you'd like me to address, be sure to put them in the comments down below. Tell me about your wins and your misses. You know, this is a community that I'm trying to build here, so we can definitely help each other out in the comments. If you'd like to talk to me a little bit more personally, be sure to email me at contactprojecthappyhome at gmail.com and I will try to respond as best as I'm able. Thanks again, you guys. I wish you all the very best day.